from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up today on Ag Day, the stock market tanks led by a huge drop in oil prices. But I just think the knee-jerk reaction here is just Crude's down 25% a day. We've got to sell everything. As fears about the coronavirus continue to haunt investors, but the news may not all be that bad. I think regardless of how this ends up, it's a huge benefit to the farmer. Good morning, I'm Tyne Morgan coming to you from our studios in Kansas City. Clinton has the day off. Well, all eyes will be on the markets today to see if they can recover after the Dow plummeted 1,800 points out of the gate on Monday. The down day also cutting into the commodity markets. Plummeting prices tripped circuit breakers Monday, which briefly stopped trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Along with concerns about the coronavirus, global oil markets also taking a nosedive. That's after Saudi Arabia started a price war against Russia. The Saudis tried to get the Russians to cut oil production to keep prices from falling even more due to the coronavirus, but Russia didn't agree. Now the Saudis are cutting prices and saying they'll increase production. Joe Vaklovic of Standard Grain says oil is the king of the markets. That and coronavirus fears is what's creating a double whammy right now when it makes these big moves and it loses 25, 30% in a day, you're gonna see these other markets react. Um, now, is that something that you're gonna to have to see play out? Um, if crude stays cheap for three or four months? No, I, I think ultimately you'd see the corn market, the soybean market, the wheat market separate itself from that. But I just think the knee jerk reaction here is just crude's down 25% in a day. We've gotta sell everything. And that's kind of what we saw at least early on Monday. The market drop on Monday also means cheaper diesel prices. Input monitors Davis Michelson says heating oil futures saw pressure to start the week, and that means on-farm diesel prices could also see a drop. I think there's room to the downside in that on-farm retail diesel price. I think now is not the correct time to book um, because the, the lag that I've noticed in my analysis between the heating oil futures and the retail price is anywhere from 7 to 22 days. And so we won't see this um, price move in the futures actually impact your at the farm gate price for at least another week, probably two to three weeks. Now, Michelson also pointing out anhydrous ammonia prices are dropping. He says prices are $100 cheaper than the same time last year, and he thinks most fertilizer prices haven't hit bottom yet. Well, as for coronavirus, there are now well over 100,000 cases around the world, with close to 600 cases reported here in the U.S. And a top Chinese expert predicts the global spread of the virus will last until at least June. He also reiterated that China's focus needs to shift from containing the spread to preventing imported cases. Many analysts and professional investors say they expect big swings to continue to dominate the market as long as the number of new virus cases continues to accelerate. They say many investors feel helpless in trying to estimate how much the virus will hurt the economy as well as corporate profits. But others say this could be a positive for farmers in the long term. I think regardless of how this ends up, it's a huge benefit to the farmer. He just received a half a point interest rate cut. Almost every major country that's financially strong is going to lower rates on purpose. And this has never happened. Last time we did this, that we had a surprise rate cut was uh, 08 on the Lehman bankruptcy. Nobody's going bankrupt here. Three weeks ago, the stock market was at all time highs. So the farmer really caught a break. They have low input prices as far as fuel. Uh, interest rates are going down and may even go down more. Let's just not go out and buy a bunch of paint this time because rates are low. Let's, let's do it a little better this time. You're going to get your inputs and money a little cheaper. Well, while some are hoping for a rebound on Tuesday, also happening today, it's Super Tuesday, number two for the Democratic presidential candidates. Contests are taking place in Washington State, Idaho, North Dakota, Missouri, and Michigan. Michigan has 125 delegates along. Democratic presidential candidates Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders spent the weekend stumping for votes. Biden currently has a delegate lead over Sanders. President Trump, meanwhile, has already collected 833 delegates for the Republican nominations. And trade deals have been talked about on the campaign trail, but one former Ag Secretary 
doesn't see one deal happening. Tom Vilsack says he doesn't see the U.S. striking an ag trade deal with India anytime soon. It comes at a time when the Trump administration is vocal about the possibility of negotiating a trade deal with the country. However, the president only struck a military deal during his visit to the country last month. Vilsack saying there are some science and religion boundaries in India, which the country is not willing to compromise on yet. Probably the most frustrating experience I had as Secretary of Agriculture was dealing with the Indian government uh, on dairy uh, because they have taken a position that because of culture and religion, they are just not in a position to, to, to approve uh, U.S. dairy products in a significant way into their market. I am skeptical that, uh, that at least in the short term that India is going to be uh, a place where we'll see a lot of business opportunity. Vilsack says the United States' chances of expanding markets in Southeast Asia are more realistic. Well, it's a wet week that may be on tap for many portions of the country. Meteorologist Cindy Claussen joins us with details. Yeah, that's right, Tyne. We are looking at some wet conditions. Many of us have already seen some wet conditions, especially in the nation's midsection, and that's where we're seeing the focus. This all, all of this rain is going to be heading into the northeast and into the mid-Atlantic over the next couple of days, but we're going to be adding more to it as we are going to see system after system bringing chances for mainly rain, but some snowflakes, especially in the northern fringes where those overnight temperatures tend to be cooler. We'll talk more about uh, rain fall over the next couple of days in just a little bit. But as you know, I love to read to kids, but I've never read to a pig. Check out this photo shared by Rachel from Montana. Rachel saying, quote, some days you just need to read cat in the hat to your pig. Can't say that I've ever done that, but it looks fun, right? <laughs> well, coming up, we'll take a look at that national forecast time. Well, in this ever-changing market right now, should you buy a put or call or maybe options? We dive into that in analysis next. And later, examining the science behind the food throw that's in the country. Well, there's a bit of hope when it comes to the ag market right now. U.S. ag trade is bucking the overall trade trend. U.S. agricultural trade data for January showed exports at $11.44 billion. That's against imports of $11.67 billion. It adds up to a trade deficit of $234 million. Well, the commodity markets continue to be weighed down as well due to pressure on the stock market. The news of a flash sale of 123,000 metric tons of soybeans to unknown destinations didn't seem to phase the markets this week. Let's get a check from the CME. The wild market swings are the order of the day right now. That stock market uh, selling off just pulled all the markets lower. And uh, the panic selling and the crisis on, on so many levels uh, just, you know, had everybody really nervous. But uh, it's really different for all parties. And I think the emergency is that we're testing the system right now. And it certainly looks like it is working. Uh, the Dow is even right now is a little bit more in line on uh, where, you know, where we should have been. Uh, for a while, you know, we know that the markets sometimes get uh, overbought and oversold. So maybe we were sitting at an overbought situation for quite a while, and now we got a little bit oversold. The market now will start to steady over the next number of days, but you expect uh, big wide ranges and a lot of swings in the market. So the markets are hitting some lows right now, but should you still consider buying a put? Ag Day's Clinton Griffiths talked to Mark Gold at this year's Commodity Classic. Mark Gold, Top Third Ag Marketing here at the 2020 Commodity Classic in San Antonio. Mark, let's talk about some of the mechanics of the market and one that we hear a lot about are options. Give us, give us your thoughts on that. Well, at Top Third, we certainly like to use options to manage the risk. We like buying the options so there's no margin calls. But a lot of farmers hear this tale out there that 85% of all options expire worthless. Mm -hmm. Well, what most of these people don't tell them is 85% of all options expire worthless at expiration. And if you buy a December put or call now or a November bean put or call now, you've got 10 months to have an opportunity to try to take money out of it. People put on an options position, just forget about it. Well, I'll give a perfect example. In this cattle market, mm -hmm. you could have bought a 125 put very cheap. It's worth an awful lot of money here today. Now, do you just stay with it? No. You buy back that call option, turn around and sell the next nearest, maybe a $105 put, buy that put, 
buy in the one you're short, take yeah. some money off the table, because nothing says this market can't go right back up to those highs in the next six months or whenever it's going to be. Right. So if you didn't do anything with that option, you just had bought it, yeah, maybe it's going to expire worth it, but you might have had 15 or 20 bucks in it at one point. Yeah. So that's the art of managing the option as an asset and be willing to take money out of it or roll them up so you can gain the maximum efficiency on them. Well, in a time when we've got a lot of uncertainty, doing some sort of management is key to staying in business, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. We've seen buy bankruptcies of farmers soar. If they would just spend a little bit of money managing the risk with some options, I believe they can do much, much better out here. And the guys that want to sell options because 85% of them expire worthless, well, they don't tell you, what do you do with the options with the 15% don't expire worthless? And if you look at these cattle puts or you look at an S&P put, anybody that sold those in the last week, they may be out of business today. Okay. We don't want to sell something for a little bit of money and risk this amount of money. We want to buy something this cheap and hope to gain that big, big section. All right, good advice. Appreciate it, Mark. As always, we'll be back for more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. For a special report on the grain markets, call toll-free at 877-TT-HEDGE. That's 877-884-3343. America's Conservation Ag Movement is brought to you by these great foundational partners, empowering resilient and sustainable agriculture. Well, have you noticed that the moon seems a little bigger right now? That's because we're seeing a series of supermoons. That's when the moon is at its closest approach to Earth in orbit, making it seem a whole lot bigger. And the phenomenon will appear full through on Wednesday. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen joins us. Cindy, that moon may be tough to see for some folks this week through all those clouds. Yeah, time that moon can definitely be hard to see when you're having to deal with raindrops and we're going to be having some of that. But as you said, we're in a series of super moons. There's going to be three in a row, and this is actually the second closest of the three. The next one will be April 7th and then May 7th after that. So you'll have another two chances if you have rain this time. So we have one front that's entering the northeastern United States. So we're going to be looking for showers and a few rumbles of thunder along this front. We have some mainly snow and some lower elevation rain in parts of the west, but we're also going to see a dosing of rain in the southwestern United States. Some of those drier areas. Areas. Let's put this into motion. Everything pulls on off to the east. Snow for the very northern fringes of this. Most of this is rain as we're seeing warmer temperatures this time of the year. Just some spotty rain and snow as you get into the upper Midwest central plains. But we've got this next low that's going to be pushing off to the east. We still see that unsettled weather, mainly rain, but some of those higher elevations will see some snow as well. And then in the Pacific Northwest, we have a cold front that will bring some rain and higher elevation snow there as well. So as we head through tonight. We're going to see high pressure moving into the southeast, start to dry things out a little bit, but you have another wave that's moving towards the Great Lakes. So look for some rain and snow to start the day on Wednesday. That low moves out of the plains and into parts of the Missouri Valley, Tennessee Valley. We still see that rain in the southwestern United States. Through the day on Wednesday, more rain coming towards parts of Missouri, Arkansas, and you see that really building up along that front in the southeastern United States. Still some rain and snow in spots in the northeast, and then another front, that one in the northwest, that's going to be moving into the northern plains as we get into our Wednesday forecast, and we'll see more unsettled weather now moving more so into the Four Corners region. Past 24 hours, a lot of it's been smack dab right in the middle of the country, but when you add the next 24 hours, you can see that all moving moves on off to the east and even the southwest getting some needed rainfall there. As far as who's getting snow, it's mostly on those northern stretches, but we do have a couple of spots in the nation's midsection that are going to be seeing some snow as well. Most of it, though, in those higher elevations in the west and far up into Maine. Temperatures pretty warm. We're looking at 80 degrees down in Texas. We're looking at 30s and 40s, so not too bad. These are temperatures that are a little above normal, and that's going to continue for a lot of the week uh, for a lot of the country. 
Into the overnight hours we go, not too bad. 30s and 40s across the north, 50s and 60s across the south. Jet stream is showing kind of a flat flow in the northern parts, but we do see a trough in the southwest. You saw the rain there, but we do see another trough developing later this week. That'll cool things down for us in the northeastern quarter of the country. Another trough develops as we get into the latter part of the weekend, drops another closed low to the southwest, so we'll see some more unsettled weather there. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. 29 Palms, California, cooler with rain likely today in a high of 61 degrees. Three Oaks, Michigan, cooler with some rain early in the day in a high of 41 degrees. And two Chestnut, Tennessee, showers and thunderstorms with a high of 64. Coming up, we continue to look at the impact of coronavirus and the impact it's having on milk prices. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Well, as the coronavirus continues to spread, there's also concern about what it could mean for milk prices. Last week, prices fell 2 to 12 cents, and cheese prices are continuing the downward fall as well. The CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, Tom Vilsack, saying there are two reasons for the drop. First is a backlog in Chinese ports. The other is reduced demand. He believes on a global basis the virus could knock 6 to maybe 7 percent off dairy prices over the next 12 months. He says prices are being partially offset by poorer weather in New Zealand. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services are being urged to lift limits on saturated fats in their upcoming dietary guidelines for Americans. The request comes from 10 top nutrition scientists from the U.S., Canada, and Denmark. They say there is no strong scientific evidence that current population-wide upper limits on commonly consumed saturated fats in the U.S. will prevent cardiovascular disease or even reduce mortality. They say a continued limit on these fats, like in whole milk, is therefore not justified. They also note there is evidence that saturated fat intake may actually be associated with a lower risk of experiencing a stroke. Well, are you ready for a little bit of March Madness later this month? Have you ever thought about the science of it all? Well, students at the University of Tennessee are focusing on it when it comes to free throws. That's next. March Madness is here, and Farm Journal is joining in on the fun with its first ever Bracket Busters Challenge. Head to agweb.com on the evening of March 15th to make your picks. Entries close when the first game starts on the 19th. The top three brackets will win Amazon gift cards. Well, it's something you see an average of 40 times in a college basketball game, a free throw. And a professor at University of Tennessee's Institute of Agriculture teaches a pretty cool class. As Charles Denny reports, it looks at the science behind shooting hoops and the physics behind the free throw. 15 feet, nothing but net for Vols basketball player Josiah Jordan James. He perfects his sweet stroke through focus and repetition. An overlooked but critical part of the game, sinking your free throws. You gotta practice it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of those shots like, it's, it's, it's sad when you miss it, because it's so easy, it's free. You think it, you're <laughs> gonna make them all, but you're not gonna make them all. Like the name says, these should be free points. Just five paces between you and the goal. Nobody guarding you. Should be easy, right? Actually, experts say there's nothing easy here. Fascinated by the foul shot, Mark Fly once made 136 free throws in a row. When he's not shooting hoops, he teaches in the UT Herbert College of Agriculture. But of course you have to have an arc, so that adds four more feet, so the ball travels about 17 feet. If we look, the ball is nine and a half inches, the goal is 18 inches, so the margin of error is plus or minus four and a half inches all the way around. Fly's research shows there's an art to the arc. But if it comes in at 55 degrees, which is taller, mm -hmm. like this, then we can see that it actually uh, makes the goal larger. Fly teaches a first year studies class called the Physics, Biomechanics, Psychology, Statistics, and Geometry of Basketball Shooting. UT freshmen learn the proper technique for making baskets a point at a time. 
elbow tucked in, good rotation and follow through. Here they have to arc the ball over this tall pole. The class is mostly for fun, but practicing free throws can be a metaphor for anything in life. It takes hard work, persistence, and attention to detail. For consistency from the free throw line, mostly what it takes is practice. Now these lines represent the path of the ball, and you can see four and a half quarter inches is pretty good here, but as you go back to the release point down at the other end, you'll see that the margin of error is about the, the width of a penny or less. So it's actually quite a miracle that we can make a shot at all. <laughs> and that's shooting straight, the science of the swish. This is Charles Denny reporting. Well, that's all the time we have on this Tuesday morning for all of us at Ag Day. I'm Tyne Morgan. Have a great day in farm country.